Um, so hi, I'm Chris Barry. I'm so excited to see everybody this month. I missed um, I missed the meeting last month, but um, today um, I am going to do a presentation just to share how um, how medical student evaluations are gathered. And um, I'm doing this with Amanda Jones and John Reedy. We did a presentation, a big project together for our <clears throat> clerkship certification. Um, so when we decided to have a session for medical student information this month, I asked John and Amanda to join me. So um, we're excited to just share with you. This is really just sharing how we um, manage the student evaluations at our institutions. And um, just to find out, we would love for you guys to share. If you do clerkship evaluations, we'd love for you to share your process with us and ask questions and um, yeah, it's just meant to be a sharing session. So without any further ado, I'm just gonna get started. <clears throat> so the goal of our slide show today is really just to share how we evaluate our medical students at our institutions, give you a chance to share your process and just emphasize the importance of real in the moment evaluations. So just to give you an idea of what the process is at our institutions. At Duke, we have a variety of evaluation um, formats. We have mid clerkship feedback, which probably most of um, the clerkships do that. Um, our clerkship is a four week clerkship. So we do it at the end of the second week. We also have a Qualtrics app that was designed from the, with the School of Medicine um, to evaluate EPAs for the students, so entrustable professional activities. And this is a formative feedback, <clears throat> a way of form, um, performing formative feedback. Um, and then we also have summative evaluations that are distributed in MedHub. Amanda? And at Marshall, these are some of the different ways that we evaluate our medical students. Like Chris said, like any other clerkship, we of course have mid clerkship feedback. Hi, <clears throat> um, I'm just wondering if the TANI is open. It is. Okay, great. Thanks so much. You're welcome. We Bye. also use informal <clears throat> feedback, which that is your typical um, feedback that it's delivered at the bedside, maybe during rounds, things that aren't necessarily on paper, as well as formative evaluations that are distributed in MedHub and summative evaluations that are also distributed at MedHub. Uh, at SUNY Upstate, we do procedural logging. We also do mid clerkship feedback as well. We do informal feedback and we also do evaluations similar to Amanda. So this is just a copy of the <clears throat> mid clerkship feedback form that we use at Duke. And you can see it's, um, it's one page and this was um, originated about two or three years ago from the School of Medicine, they had each of the clerkships <clears throat> create a form that's tailored to their clerkship. So ours includes a space for student feedback where our clerkship directors gather feedback when they're having the, the session with the students. We track their EPAs. There's four required EPAs that the students have to complete on their neurology clerkship. That varies from clerkship to clerkship. We track whether or not they've done and had an observed history or observed performing the neuro exam, which are tied into the EPAs. Uh, previously to the EPAs, we had a skills checklist that students had to turn in and they had to document being observed, taking the history and performing the different steps of the neuro exam. Um, students have to log all their patients in Blue Rex and hopefully they will see at least one patient of these different varieties um, through the, the, the <clears throat> these are LCME requirements. Um, so hopefully while they're on their neuro clerkship, they'll see each of these diseases. We have 13 online lectures that now the students can view at their own pace throughout the month. Um, and we track those to make sure that they're completed and they score an 80% or better. We have a case vignette write-up that students have to turn in and then they have a presentation session with one of our faculty members. So we just ask them to submit that by a specific date. 
when they meet with their um, with the clerkship directors, <clears throat> that's where they will share like what some of the feedback is that they've received for the first two weeks. They'll go over required course. Um, the, they review the <laughs> course requirements, ask the students if they have questions, and then they can document like areas of improvement. Um, they can check in with them about whether or not they've written notes on their patients. And then we ask them like what their plans are for studying for the shelf exam. So pre-COVID, we met with the students one-on-one uh, -on -one in person. And when we went virtual last year, we did this all, we still do it all by Zoom. And we use a QR code that we send to them to attest to having received feedback. So that is a requirement um, from the medical school. And how do we do that? We just send this QR code that's um, created in Qualtrics with a survey that they have to complete. And it's pretty simple. They enter their name, they attest to receiving feedback, they attest to being observed taking the exam, I mean, taking a history and then also performing the exam. So once they've done all of these things and before the last day of the clerkship, they have to submit this and um, I track that. And then every few months, I send a report to the School of Medicine uh, with the attestations because the students are asked on their graduation exam, did they receive feedback? And this is one way we can make sure that they're <laughs> receiving feedback. Um, so then another thing that we use is the EPAs. And this was designed through the School of Medicine. And this is a dashboard that we have <clears throat> that we can all see and track our students. So up here is where we would look up the student's name and which clerkship they're on. This tells us like the number of EPAs they've <clears throat> completed. And again, they have four EPAs that they're supposed to complete the history taking the exam, differential diagnosis, and presentations. And so when the students are on their service or in the clinic, they show this QR code on their ID badge to their faculty or residents and have them scan that. And that brings up the <clears throat> screen in Qualtrics that they choose which clerkship they're on, so if they're on neurology, and then the EPAs that the student can be evaluated on display and the evaluator simply chooses which EPA they're evaluating on. And this is just an example of what the question looks like, um, whether or not the student obtained a focused history <clears throat> pertinent in an organized fashion. And so then the evaluator will choose which one of the, um, choose the correct choice. And ultimately the feedback ends up going to the student, they get a notification. Um, and then we can track the student's progress on the dashboard. So specifically which EPAs they've completed, it'll show what kind of improvement the student needs. And then last but not least, there's a place at the bottom where we can see which evaluators have completed EPAs. And last but not least, we do our summative evaluations in MedHub, like many folks do. Um, and we streamlined our form a couple years ago. It used to be about four, four pages long with lots of check boxes. And we went to <clears throat> a much simpler form that everyone is much happier with. So basically the evaluators have to attest to not having provide, not having had provided healthcare services. They indicate the number of days they worked with the student. We now are on an unsatisfactory and satisfactory grading system that was implemented last year um, for the summer term of students in the last academic year and has gone forward. We'll be continuing the satisfactory, unsatisfactory grading scheme in next year's um, class as well. There's a place for them to indicate what they think the house staff potential is for the students. Um, that's going to stay on through this academic year, but then it will be removed starting next academic year and folks will still be able to indicate their house staff potential in the narrative. And then we have a little numerical score, which is, you know, zero to 100, which is really just internal. It helps us gauge the performance of the way the evaluator is evaluating the students. Um, 
it used to be really important for us when we had an honors <clears throat> high pass, pass and fail system. But um, really this is just internal for us now. But the other big change that we made is that we added these little tips for evaluators. So best practices for writing the narrative so that we could help improve the narratives um, that some of some folks used to just say, well, Sally did a great job on the clerkship. They were really nice, but they wouldn't address some of the skills that we wanted them to evaluate. So we've given them some prompts to you know, help them draft a narrative. And it's really, really made a big difference. Um, folks that used to just write you know, one or two little sentences now provide a lot more substantial data. Um, so some of the things are just what their history taking ability was, their skills, their neuro exam skills, their presentations, funded knowledge, um, how staff potential, as I mentioned, what their um, personal and professional relations are with the staff and patients and families and um, teamwork, et cetera. So, and then down at the bottom that you can't see is the place where they can write their narrative. So strengths and then areas of improvement. So um, just what our requirements are for the School of Medicine, um, we have to submit our attestation reports for the mid-clerkship feedback. So I do send that Qualtrics report to them usually every three or four months. And then um, the School of Medicine is always keeping up with the EPAs. So there's a dashboard and they can view all of the clerkship information at one time. And they will share that feedback with us as well. And then <clears throat> we also have required training at our institution for meeting with the faculty and the residents each year. Usually we do this twice a year. In July, the course director and I go over and meet with the um, new residents when they're um, having their noon conference. And we just show them the EPA, the QR code for that. We bring that up and show them how to fill that out. We talk to them about um, best practices for formative feedback and summative evaluations. And we just um, continue to stress the importance of submitting their evaluations um, on time, especially for mid clerkship feedback. Um, and by us really stressing the importance of that to them once or twice a year, that has really helped us gather um, the evaluations um, much easier. It's much easier to gather the information. They seem to understand that it's really important that we get that each month for all the students. So anyway, that's just an overview of what we do at Duke. Now Amanda's gonna talk about Marshall. So Marshall, this is the mid-clerkship feedback form that we use. This form is standard across our university. It's not tailored to a specific clerkship or specialty. We track each student's course requirement progress and document it on this form. The clerkship directors will then add their own comments and review those comments and feedback with the student. And it's distributed and completed via MedHub. So you can see on the form that they are graded on patient care, medical knowledge, practice-based learning and improvement, their interpersonal and communication skills, professionalism and systems-based practice. There are open text boxes for the strengths of the student, any opportunities that we can find for growth or improvement, and a note as to whether or not their patient encounters and procedure logs have been reviewed. So that way, if they're behind, if they're on track, they're aware of that. And then you also see the drop-down boxes to indicate whether or not the patient encounter log is on track, if the procedure log is on track, there's an open text for comments. And then there's also a note to you can note if the student is on track to pass the rotation and if this information has been reviewed with the student. Our midpoint isn't necessarily a true midpoint in terms of being three and a half weeks into the rotation, our clerkship is integrated. So a midpoint for a student could be at the end of week five, beginning of week six, depending upon when they rotate with neurology in that seven weeks. So our formative and summative evaluations here at Marshall, once again, we use MedHub to distribute and complete all of our formative and summative evaluations. Each Friday, I send evaluations out to the faculty and residents who worked with the students each week. These are our formative evaluations. And these weekly formative evaluations are compiled into a composite, which becomes their final summative evaluation with their final clerkship grade. 
So what kind of training do we provide to our faculty and residents? We meet with our faculty each year, typically in July, like our first faculty meeting of the academic year, to review any changes to our student evaluation process and discuss best practices for feedback and summative evaluations. This past year is our first year with MedHub. So when we started that transition, we had to meet with the faculty and kind of walk them through the software and make sure everybody was on the same page. Our residency program director meets with our residents every year during orientation to discuss their role as an educator, as well as how to provide evaluations with valuable feedback. We've had residents before that have just put, like Krista said before, you kind of generic good student, student did well. So making sure that they understand the importance of not only timely feedback, but valuable feedback. Here at SUNY Upstate, we do a majority of the same practices as Duke and Marshall, just to a different extent. Uh, for our mid-clerkship feedback, I create an individualized clerkship checklist, which Chris is showing you right now. Just kind of walks them through, um, are they being directly observed by an attending for their history, their mental status, basically the neurologic exam. And on the other side is our procedural logging. Are they seeing these procedures while on service? It just gives the students uh, an ability to see what, what we see. And if we're nervous, if they have all zeros by mid clerkship, then we can talk to them about that. Um, on the bottom, it just says, you know, faculty and student com or resident comments. We talk about their write ups and if they've done their calls. Um, when the students come to mid clerkship feedback, they're ex expected to have done their self uh, evaluation. Uh, we learn a lot from this. A lot of the students think they're perfect from start to finish, you know, even in clerkship one, they think they're amazing. And it's kind of a, it's eye opening to us to know where they see themselves. So that's just a little example. After the feedback session, the students get an attestation form. I didn't, I didn't include it because it's just a checkbox and it's in MedHub. Lastly, our program director completes the individualized student evaluations in MedHub, and the students can see these. Just as Amanda and Marshall, we use MedHub for all of our evaluation needs. Uh, I do have evaluations going out on different days. I noticed that when our faculty left service, if their evaluations came out on that day, chances are it take two to three weeks to get them done. And we really are pushing for within 12 days. So we actually moved our attending services or our attending evaluations to go out on Wednesday before they leave service. And this has helped quite a bit. Um, I just, like I said, yep. The next slide is just an example of our faculty to student and there's three pages to it. So it's just our faculty. We have eliminated any uh, numerical or word associated scales like good, better, best because the students felt that they were not being fairly accommodated. Um, we do use the comments to create a clerkship narrative for the students at the end. And it's, this style is more uh, based on milestones. That's what our school decided we want to go with. Um, to me, this is the most important. In my opinion, we canceled doing reflection sessions in person with our PD and the students when the pandemic hit, obviously. This just was a, a great opportunity for us to get informal feedback from the students. You know, they didn't feel like, they felt safe in a little space that they could just talk to us, tell us what's going on, what they feel about the program, what they think we could do better in, or just something that we don't understand before it got to the final emails that our College of Medicine got and said, why is the student complaining about this? Or why was this not nipped in the butt? I think that if we can get back to some more informal in-person reflection sessions that this should help us out greatly. And like I said, I, it says in the last one, we tried to use Zoom and it just, it didn't work. People just sat there in silence and it just, it was lacking. Next slide. And then uh, just as Duke and Marshall, our program director meets with our faculty and residents at the start of the academic year, usually in July. The PD discusses any changes, and reteaches the residents about the neurologic exam and his expectations. Uh, our program director also gives faculty training sessions quarterly to the faculty during department meetings. And we also share the aggregate evaluations of the residents and the faculty uh, like two to three times a year. So. 
Chris. Okay, so that's our uh, presentation. We would love to <clears throat> have anybody that wants to share what their evaluation process is to share with us. Um, and if you have any questions about how we have, um, how we go about our evaluations, if you need help with um, forms or the, um, an app for EPAs, or if you want us to share our process with you, we'd be happy to, to do that. And you can email us at our email address, or you can ask us questions now, or anyway, that's it. Peggy, you're muted. <laughs> Thank you. We all have those issues, don't we? <laughs> Well, thank you for that. Um, it's amazing how we all do things differently, but it's the same, right? To end at the same thing. So, Lucy, do we have time? I mean, do we want to take some questions now? Sure. Yep, we have some time if, if there's questions. So, so you can just unmute and ask your question, or if you want to just share something, you know, new and improved. We, we just went to some online stuff or some um, using the WBAs this year. So we're looking for those answers um, as a program. If somebody has construction going on, maybe they could mute. I'm sorry, I do. So I'm going okay. to, <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, Peggy, it doesn't look like there's any questions, so I think I can jump into my segment for the given overview or an update. Of okay, the, thank you. Anybody. If you want to share the slides, please. Thank you. So I thought I'd use some time today in, in our meeting to just kind of um, remind and go over some things that we have um, for our annual meeting that's coming up here um, in the next few weeks. Next slide, Allison. <clears throat> So just as far as registration, a reminder that the early registration deadline is March 25th, which is in two days. And so I just wanted to remind you of that. And as we've done in the past, this year, we're not able to offer a discount code. I know we've done that for some years now, but um, just in the current state of where we're, we're at with as far as budgeting, and I know budgets are tight for you also at this time, but for this year, we're not able to offer the discount code. So just a reminder of what the rates are and just the early registration deadline. Next slide, Allison. So as far as um, these two meetings, these are um, would have been in person if we were um, meeting, you know, um, at, at, in person at the annual meeting. But these we're offering them outside of the meeting just because the meeting is is condensed so much and there's you know it's only so much time during the weeks the days of the meeting rather. And so we we decided to offer these business meetings for the program directors on our next meeting for our consortium outside of that meeting week. So these are not um, required as registration is not required for these or meeting registration, I should say. And so these are available to you um, to participate in similar to like the meeting we're having today. Next slide. I wanted to highlight um, and remind again of our three programs that we have in place for coordinators and that is part of the annual meeting and Peggy and uh, Chris are, do, are doing one of these talks. We have uh, four other of our coordinators that are doing the other two talks. So just a reminder of what these talks are that are part of the meeting schedule. Next slide. And also, I know a lot of you also attend this in, 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 in partnership with our directors. And so this is just a reminder of when this is available as part of the meeting schedule. This is our clerkship and program director conference. And I know some of the content is relevant to you. We do have three resident program programs that we were able to create as part of our annual meeting schedule. Um, these are the three that are listed here, tele teleneurology for residents, psychiatry, and child neurology for, um, for our residents. So these are three brand new programs that we, I wanted to make you aware of and remind you to encourage your trainees to participate in and attend during the meeting. 
We do have a new um, networking session that we we have in place, and this is to help trainees when they come, you know, or enter the meeting that they're able to meet with a physician and just get some one on one time some Q&A, help them to navigate the meeting. Do they have questions, you know, about certain programming? What are they can't miss things? Um, just some general, you know, a, a, a nice way for them to connect with the physician while at the meeting to get some information. Trainee Trivia, Allison, I'll let you take this. Yes. So as you may know, we have our AN Trainee Trivia events monthly. And so we will be doing one during the annual meeting, but uh, meeting registration is not required. So it is still the same format of the Zoom link, checking the AN website for that. And it is Wednesday, April 21st. Um, and so if your residents do attend, making sure that they know it's on a Wednesday for this one and the time is a little bit different as well. So it'll be 6 to 7 p.m. Central Time. I do want to highlight as far as our, our, our um, AAN website, we do have a dedicated page for GME programming. So following this meeting, we'll send you that link to where, where all of this information will is and will be up, continually updated. And following the meeting also, we can send the slides. I know that's helpful um, for a lot of you to see that. So we'll also make sure you get the slides. Next slide, Allison. So I wanted to, to take a, a, some time and go over this event here. And there's a few slides in relation to this. But this we typically have, for those that have attended in the past, this is our Monday night premiere event that we have at the meeting in person. And it's about a three hour event where we're able to connect trainees with directors and faculty um, across the country for our residency and fellowship programs. And so this year we tried to really think, okay, we're gonna be virtual. How can we still offer this? You know, What does this reception look like now virtually? So what we did is we still wanted to have the poster element, which I know a lot of you have submitted those you know, you know, submitted for. We currently have 92 programs that have submitted. So that's a great, a, you know, a, a good number of, of, of uh, programs that wanna participate. So we decided to offer the e-posters. And again, you can have choose to have residency and or fellowship information on this poster. And we've added a, a few networking panels, four that'll take place during the meeting. So the posters and the four panels during the meeting, it, there's obviously registration required for those. We decided since we the posters will be available six months post the meeting that we're gonna offer a few six panel sessions. These panel sessions are not, it's not required for any sort of registration. So those, even though, you know, we understand that a lot of folks would not be able to attend the meeting or participate. These panel sessions would, that will be post meeting will be available to any trainee that wants to participate. Next slide. So I'll talk a little more about the e-posters here. As you know, we, we're working with a, with a vendor to offer our meeting, complete meeting virtually. And, and the vendor that we've um, uh, partnered with is Kenis and they're an international vendor. Um, and we, we're just trying to figure out how to really offer these posters. What does it mean for engagement? So we're, we're, the posters are gonna be available throughout the week of the annual meeting. So the April 17th through the 22nd. But how do we get folks to really look at these posters and engage and get some you know, get some one-on-one -on -one time? So one of the ways we're gonna do that is through this kickoff that we've planned. So on Sunday from, on April 18th from five to seven Eastern, we have this, we have a two hour dedicated time where we thought we would have a five to 10 minute overview with um, Dr. Khan, who is the chair of our graduate education subcommittee, providing an overview of what the posters are, encourage trainees to, to participate and view the posters and explain why. And then following that 10 minutes, we've encouraged you to schedule your own Zoom meeting so that they can interact with you. Now, what I sent out, I think, um, yesterday is a Google um, document that I've input as much information as I can that you provided as far as what your, you know, who's your contact, who's your um, presenter going to be at the meeting, what your social media information is, and then also to input when you're going to be available for these Zoom meetings. You don't have to do all of the Zoom meetings. It's whenever you're available. If this e this uh, Google document is what I'm going to use as an e-brochure that I'll download and send it to the trainees and, and provide it during this kickoff so they're able to see these are all the posters that we have. We currently have 92. On Sunday during this time, these are the programs from five to seven that are available. Here's the, here's the you know, this is the, the Google form for you to look, find, their, find their link and the other times that we have for the, for the panel sessions. What we did is offer times after the panel session so that you that, they, that encourages them to then 
participator, you know, with the presenters. So this is a this is a just a, a, a summary of what the posters are. Next slide, Allison. And as I mentioned, the four panels during the meeting, these are our topics that we've um, you know, secured as far as um, having speakers and um, a moderator and four panelists. So the, these are the topics. It's a so it's 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 career a career perspective. You know, if they want to understand what what uh, getting a fellowship and how to get into a fellowship, and once you're in a fellowship, how what are the you know the touch points that you want to make sure that you have for, with your for your fellowship. Um, if you're interested in a career as a general 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 neurologist, um, you know, clinician educator, and then physician scientist. So we have a moderator that we've secured, and then four to five panelists that we have invited to serve on these panels. I'm currently in the process of solidifying those folks, and once I have their names, I'll, I'll share those. But these are the times for the panels. So, so the way we've built the engagement is following the panel, for example, on Saturday from four to five, we've we, we will indicate during these panels that, you know, remind them of the posters and following that particular panel session to review the list again of posters. And if there's, if the uh, department or program has decided to have a, a Zoom meeting, you know, you can certainly do that after the panel session. So we're not trying to conflict with the times of the panels. We also are trying to figure out how to in, how they, how they can view the posters and some engagement for, for programs to have with these trainees. Next slide. And as I mentioned, we will have the six um, panels post meeting. Um, registration is not required for these, and so we're trying to figure out what those topics are, and we'll schedule those from May to October um, of this year. Next slide. I will go over some awards and scholarship, but right now, if I, I can take questions, if you have it for in relation to the meeting information I just provided. I don't see any questions in the I chat. I just have one question um, regarding the coordinators forum. Is there just like three different topics did I see or did I miss something? Yep, Allison, if you can go back, there are three, uh, three, uh, courses that we've offered, they're hour-long courses. In addition to that, I, I neglected to put on here, Peggy is also doing what we call a, call a conversation corner that um, is 30 minutes in length. And I, I can't remember the date and time off the top of my head, but once we're done with this meeting, like I said, we'll send that information up. So that's in addition to this, that Peggy will have some one-on-one -on -one time to communicate with coordinators. Thank you. Welcome. Lucy, I have a question regarding the posters. Sure. So um, you're having these panel discussions and they're set for those times. Does that mean the program director cannot interact with the trainee until after that panel time? Correct. Okay. We want them to, we want the trainees to be, to participate in the panel sessions and following the panels, then they can have time to interact with the- Because um, well, that makes a difference for when the program director is available on Zoom on the Zoom link right. to talk to the trainee. Yep. Okay. So yeah, for example, on like I said, on Monday, the panel is from four to five. We're saying that we would like for you, the program director, to be available anytime after five. That works for their schedule to interact with the trainees. Okay. Okay. Is that for the kickoff as well? The kickoff, we've scheduled it for two hours. So we're just going to take the first 10 minutes to give an overview. And then really from like 510 to 7 is when we're encouraging them to view the list of posters that's available and look at who has Zoom meetings and, and click on those links and interact with those programs. And Lucy, I may have missed this, but uh, what time zone are these times listed? These are in? all Eastern. Eastern Daylight Time. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I see in the chat, there's a question on the discount. Um, there is no discount this year for coordinators to, to register for the meeting. A question in the chat, how will we get information regards, regarding business meeting events if we're not registered for the meeting? The business meetings are happening prior to the dates of the annual meeting. And then we will continue our meetings as a, as a consortium monthly thereafter. Yep. 
see any other questions now in the chat, but we can I can come back to answer a few questions. I'll go over now uh, the awards and scholarships. I just wanted to give you a, an update on where we stand with those. So as you know, we have a resident scholarship to the annual meeting and a fellow scholarship to the annual meeting. We're currently able to, uh, we, we currently have 101 completed applications, I should say. We have two pending that we think we're waiting on a few program director letter of recommendations. So we will, in the next day here, be sending those emails out to those residents, letting them know that they have received the scholarship, and then we will take care of registering them for the annual meeting. If they've already registered, we'll reimburse their the how you reimburse how they paid for the meeting. So if they paid by credit card, the, the um, you know with their credit card or what have you, the refund will go back to that credit card that was used for the payment. Fellow scholarship, we have we did receive 32 applications. Unfortunately, we only have funding to um, select 23. I did this morning reach out to another um, sponsor and see if they can um, you know. Uh, fund the other uh, remaining applicants. So hopefully we'll be fully funded, but as of right now, we can only select 23. So we're in the process of our grading. We should be able to announce um, in the next day or two. Next slide. And then we have our two leadership programs. We have our enhanced resident leadership program. We did select 15 of those um, recipients and we sent out those notifications. We had a few duplicates that, uh, uh, that applied for enhanced as well as residents. So we have to just go through that to make sure we didn't have um, duplicate um, uh, applicants in there, but we did notify the 15 and our director mentorship. This is the uh, opportunity for our uh, more seasoned directors to um, uh, mentor our new um, uh, directors to as far as clerkship, fellowship or um, residency. And so we received 50 applications and we're currently in the process of pairing them so that they can um, start their. Next slide. I wanted to just uh, put a slide in here as a reminder of what our ABPN um, wards are. This is for the American uh, Board of Psychiatry and Neurology. These are awards that are applicable for your fact for your um, directors, I should say. So when you receive the slides, if you can just um, remind them of these opportunities for their portfolio so they can apply for these awards. Next slide, Allison. Yes, yeah, so another um, thing that we just launched was our virtual resident education lecture series. And so our first one was on March 18th and these are free, they're monthly um, 60 minute talks and so it provides residents access to subspecialty expertise that may not be currently available at their institution. Um, when we sent out our Google form a lot, we're saying that due to COVID, things had been canceled, um, they needed more resources. And so we launched our virtual resident education lecture series um, for March 18th. So they are pre recorded. It does take a little bit to have them edited, but it'll be live on our website soon. And then our next one is April 8th. Uh, from 11 to 12 p.m. Central, and the topic will be neurogenetics um, by Dr. Peter Todd from University of Michigan. So spread the word and um, please reach out. We will also, we can also send the website link for this one as well. I just put one question in there just to so are all of our residents then if they're a member there they get they're on the listserv yes so they are on the listserv and then they get the uh, email saying like trainee trivia is happening and virtual resident education lecture series is happening and then it is in our newsletters as well thank you you're welcome so now we move on to us again so based on sorry before we jump in there's a few questions in chat in relation to oh, this. I'm sorry. okay so if we can answer those um uh, is there a way to incorporate these lectures into our into our didactics you certainly can we um as allison said they're going to be recorded as soon as we have edited them they'll be on our website so you can feel free to access and use those as you see fit for your programs and um, we'll send the link out to um, to coordinators to let them know. We do have a dedicated web web page for this on our website, so we'll send a, a link to that. I just want to take a minute and go back here before there was a question on for the posters. How do you get the Zoom links? 
Um, once I have everything um, solidified um, as far as um, you know what the um, program information looks like, I will be sending a, um, a kind of a brochure with overall links so that you can find out the link for the kickoff session, the link for the panel session, so you have all of that information. So I'll be following up with some communication around that. Lucy, can I um, make a plug for the um, coordinator sessions that we're having? Um, so for any of our clerkship coordinators that are on the call today, um, just so you know that if you have not done um, the clerkship certification program um, in the past year or two, um, that is something that if you're interested in doing um, by attending the um, three sessions that we have at AAN this year, um, those will meet the first process for the clerkship certification process. So um, if you're interested in finding out more about that, if you haven't gone through that, um, that's usually a two year process. You can reach out to me and um, Celia Linton and I are certified to um, present that course. And the first part of that um, process is actually gonna be covered in um, the first session that we have in um, I think it's on Saturday, the vital roles of clerkship coordinators. So anyway, if you are interested in finding out more about that, you can reach out to me um, or Celia, but email me and I can get you in touch with her. Um, we can have a little conversation with you and give you more info. Hopefully in one of our future webinars, we can have a session about that if there's enough interest. So thanks. Okay, I think we're good now to move on. So I'm just gonna tag team on, on back to that. Professional development is so important for coordinators um, because um, I think there's a lot of burnout that people don't always stay in the positions that long. So um, part of the um, feedback we had from our surveys earlier in the year, we're going to launch our first two work groups and professional development would include um, would include that professionalism or this the certification for clerkship. It would always also could include um, any of these resources listed on this slide. Um, but these are things that you guys have said that you wanted in the surveys. And um, please be thinking. I think Lucy, we're gonna are we gonna launch this in at the at the business meeting on April the sixth. Well, we have um, co connected with the folks that indicated they wanted to be part of these work groups. So we, the next step is once I hear back from everybody is to kick off these groups, have a few calls with, you know, the leaders of these work groups and the participants um, to kind of, you know, start the planning process. But in the meantime, as you can see, everybody that's on this call, you see the groups that we're currently trying to plan. There, there are a lot of subtopics under here. So we, we will need some help as far as you know, some of these topics. So if there's an area of interest based on what you see here on the slide that you wanna help and be part of like a subgroup on, please let us know and we can um, get you connected. So right, the other, so we have coordinator communications. You know, if we could, you know, really divide and conquer, we can each take a piece of the pie basically and it wouldn't, it wouldn't take too much um, of our time. So I encourage you to think about it um, coordinator communications work group, and then again, the professional development for coordinators work group. I guess we're ready then for the next slide. So on to our new business um, and next meeting. So um, our, our business meeting will be April the 6th from 2 to 3.30 p.m. Um, Eastern Standard Time or Eastern Daylight Time. And um, We'll be discussing um, new business. We're going to have a guest speaker, um, uh, Dr. Carrie Adair, and she is the Assistant Director of Research at Duke Center for Health Healthcare Safety and Quality. And our topic will be the science of well-being, strategies for managing stress during a COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. We know that we have clerkship coordinators, we have fellowship, we have um, residency coordinators. So it's important for us. And we have PEDS, which is also a little different. They're, they're kind of doing both hats as well. 
um, it's very important for us to try to have something in there for everyone. So that'll be the topic of the, um, the guest speaker presentation. But I do encourage everyone to um, attend our business meeting. It is not, it doesn't cost, um, but it's also sort of setting the roadmap for next year. Um, Chris and I will be both, I'll continue my next year's chair and Chris will be the chair elect. Um, so we do encourage you to um, get involved. We're going to continue our monthly meetings. So April will be the business meeting. We won't have a, um, a session, a learning session, but back in May, we'll start back up. So I hope you find these useful and I would encourage you to um, let us know if you have a topic you want us to cover or you want you want to cover a topic with us. Um, that would be great. Are there questions? We're going to give you back a few minutes early if there aren't any questions. Chris, anything we miss? Any parting? Comment. No, um, it's just so wonderful to see so many people on our call today. So um, we're really, really excited to be able to start having these meetings every month. Um, so, yeah, we would love for you to share your ideas for future um, sharing sessions. Um, so if you're if you have something you'd like to share with the group, we're trying to alternate months. Um, so one month might be focused on clerkship coordinator issues and another month might be the other month, the next month would be um, focused more on um, residency and fellowship topics. So please feel free to reach out to any of us, Peggy, Lucy, Allison, or myself um, with suggestions. Um, and we definitely encourage you to get involved in our work groups. So. If you have suggestions or are interested in participating in those, you can reach out to us as well. I just have one thing I want to say, um, Lucy, and I guess Allison, you guys have put together the AANEM uh, portfolio for the neuromuscular uh, applicants. That has been awesome. Mm -hmm. The only thing that I suggest is we add a picture or a photo for next year because we can't <laughs> tell what they look like. <laughs> But that is a great portal. We we are really liking it here in Houston. That's good feedback to get. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. In, in parting words, I guess I encourage everyone to join the AAN. We have a lot of great resources, but also we're, we're continuing building. And Lucy and Allison, thank you again for being such a supportive of, of us as we're still in our toddler stage here, infancy. Um, growing as, as a group. So thank you very much for that. And um, if there's nothing else, we will hope to see you guys next month at the, um, at the conference. Thanks so much, everybody. Take care. Take care.